Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm very delighted to see you all today. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the host, creator, and chief cat herder of the forum. And I'm very excited about this week's topic, an unusual one in terms of multimedia and technology. But before we get into the topic, let's explain the forum. Let's show you how the technology works and give you a little bit of background. So to begin with, you should know the Future Trends Forum is a discussion-based venue. This is all about conversation, all about our thoughts, our feelings, our ideas as we share them back and forth over video. Now, this is the spin-off from a previous project that's still going on called the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report, or FTTE. And FTTE is the trends enough to try to better understand where higher education is going. And that includes the forum, it includes the FTTE report, it includes a book club, about which we'll talk about at the end of this hour, it includes a bookstore, a blog, and more things to come. So if you haven't seen that, go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now we can only do this work with the help of generous supporters, and I'd like to thank them before we proceed. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to thank NizerNet from New York State. That's a non for profit that helps that state's colleges and universities get connected with high-speed internet and do some amazing things with networking. They do terrific work from professional development to research and technology, and we're really grateful for their support. We're also really grateful to Shindy, because as you can see, Shindy makes available the technology that we're using right now. So let me take a minute and just walk you through it, if you're new to it or if you haven't been here for a while. So first of all, where I am right now, and where this slide is, just for a minute, is called the stage. And it's called the stage because everyone involved in this video conference can see and hear everything that goes on up here. Think of it as a stage within an auditorium or a concert venue. Now, I'm up here right now. These slides will be here just for a second. And then you can join us. This is where our guest, Jason Schmidt, will be in just a minute. But you can join us as well, and I'll show you how. Now, right below us is what I think of as a participant swarm. You'll see many, many dozens of icons around you. And some of them are full video feeds. Some of them are photos. Some of them are silhouettes. And each represents one or more people signing into this video conference from somewhere on Earth right now. Now, if you'd like to learn more about a person or if you'd like to talk with them, double-click on their icon. And if they want to talk to you and their microphone and camera is working, then your two icons will click together like Legos. You can have your own private audiovisual bubble, which is pretty neat. Now, there are a lot of ways to participate in this conversation. Let me show you three right off the bat. Look at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a white strip running along it, and it has a series of buttons and options. One of them on the left is an option for a chat box. It looks like a little number, I think it's 34, uh, along with um, a little icon of people. Click on that and two little windows will pop up. The one on the left will give you an overview of everyone who's participating. And on the right is a little chat box. Now you can chat, basic text chat, with about 19 or so people who've signed in with you. Now, we segment this into individual rooms as people log in. So we find historically people in the forum like to chat about the ideas they're hearing. They like to try out questions. Sometimes they share links to resources that have come up. Uh, it's a nice informal way to chat. And in fact, right now, if you haven't done so already, take a minute to introduce yourself. Just type in who you are and where you're from today. Now, back to that white strip. Next to the chat icon, you'll see a question mark with a circle around it. And that's a great way to participate. That's, if you click on it, it pops up a little box, which lets you type in a comment or a question. And we receive that, and when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen so everyone can see it, and then I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. Now, next to that little question mark, you'll see a raised hand button. This is the best one. That, if you click on that, that tells us that you want to join us up here on stage. All you have to do is make sure that your microphone and camera are working and that you're in a space like where I am right now where you can talk freely. And when the time is right, we'll beam you up here people at a time. So with me and our guest, that's two other slots. So we can almost generate a kind of pop-up panel as we go. It sounds complicated. It's actually really easy to do. If you'd like to, just click the raised hand and I'll beam you up. Now, on top of that, if that's not enough ways to communicate and share thoughts during this hour, head over to Twitter. Uh, just use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, and already people there are making comments and sharing their thoughts. So if you'd like to, just tweet away. Just make sure you use the hashtag FTTE. So that's how the technology works. 
We're really grateful to Shindig for making it available, and we're grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to our friends on Patreon uh, for their support. Patreon is a crowdfunding the Kickstarter or GoFundMe. It lets you support someone making a creative project. In this case, it's us making this creative work about the future of education and technology. And you can see here from the slide that we have a ton of people participating, uh, people contributing as little as a dollar a month. The people here on the slide contribute $10 a month or more. Folks like Jeannie Kim Han, Christopher Downs, Michael Haggins, Chris Lott, uh, Corey S., yes, lots of wonderful people. If you'd like to join them or if you'd like to learn more, just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander and you can learn more. We're really grateful to them for their conversation and for their support. So that's where all this comes from. That's how it's supported. That's how the technology works. Um, let me introduce you to this week's guest. And a couple of things before we start. First of all, uh, we're dealing with a few complex topics, including technology, including international markets and uh, scholarly publication. So if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask. And second, um, open is a theme that the forum has been exploring since we began. We've been looking at open teaching. We've been looking at open educational resources. In fact, we've had at least two guests who have worked on open access and scholarly publication. So today's guest is going to help us continue that theme by looking at scholarly publication. I'm just delighted uh, to welcome Jason. Uh, Jason is a professor at Clarkson University, uh, where he does, among other things, research into media. He's also a fantastic filmmaker who has made a documentary that we will be talking about called Paywall, The Business of Scholarship. And Jason will be introducing that and answering questions about it as we go. So let me just welcome Jason, welcome to the forum, express my jealousy for his bookshelf, and uh, hey, Jason, glad to see you. Uh, Brian, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with you all, and it's an honor to talk about open access and research publishing and in all venues, and I'm really excited to be here. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Let, let me ask first just the most important question that human can possibly ask each other in March, which is, what's the weather like there in upstate New York? Hey, it's it, it finally, this is the first day that Siberia has broken. We're about almost 50 degrees, and it's so, so from Siberia comes flooding, and so we're in flooding zone now. Right. It, right. It's, it's been hovering around 10 to 20 degrees, you know, for the last week, and before that it was, you know, zero. Wow. So it's, yeah, it's a well, well needed uh, warm up. That's a nice uh, symbolic attachment to open access. Maybe the dawn has come. Maybe spring has hey, come. Um, it has in some ways recently. Oh, great. Um, well, uh, l let me ask you just, um, and let me just say, um, I, I appreciate that. We just moved from Vermont to uh, the DC area, and today it is about uh, 60 here. So I'm enjoying wearing uh, light shirts and uh, you know, seeing what it's like to live outside of the North Country. Yeah, um, and Brian, maybe it should be, you know, we met up in Vermont when you were a resident and I was a resident just a few years yeah. ago. I was at Green Mountain College, which we all know as of a few weeks ago has had some dire news. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that plays into some of these conversations of trying to lessen burdens on university structures. It does. Let's let's definitely come back to that. Um, let me, just to introduce you a bit more to, uh, to our audience, what are you going to be working on the rest of uh, 2019? What lies ahead for you in terms of research, filmmaking, and teaching? Well, I've, you know, the, the, the speaking on open access has been tremendous. I've been, you know, tr traveling quite extensively over the last maybe three months or so. Um, really? been, yeah, been a lot of places. And that's been really just eye-opening to see the, the, the global view towards open access and open science. I was in Indonesia here two weeks ago. I was in Nice, France. The week prior to that, I was at Oxford University and the British Library through the donations of Arcadia Foundation. I was at University of Iceland recently, uh, Berlin and Munich here in December. Um, you know, just it's, it's been kind of tremendous just to see the again the global interest and intrigue on, on this. So that's that's what's happened now. Uh, you know, I, I have an interest towards broader open science and specifically reproducibility crisis sort of in my pocket that I want to first pursue more as a journalist before ever thinking of, you know, again, kind of the, the filmmaking uh, direction. But so that's that's where my 2019 is. We're continuing to, to speak out and open open access and academic journal publishing and and also with an eye on reproducibility journalism for 2019, 2020. That's a huge topic. Um, we haven't uh, addressed reproducibility crisis here, but uh, 
uh, we really should. I mean, that's a that's a major topic. It's clobbering some fields like psychology. Yeah, that's right. Big big in psychology. Well, excellent, excellent. Um, let me. Uh, well, I wanted to um, share a clip from uh, Paywall, but first, if, if let me just ask you, what what led you as a media studies guy, as a journalist, as a filmmaker, what led you to open access? I mean, that's a kind of arcane subject. I mean, it's gone. Yeah. In the market, that what led you to it? As a as a journalist, I would always write about you know corporate creativity and understanding corporate kind of prerogatives in a in a kind of innovation sense. And I was always seeking out stories, and that was sort of my beat with Huffington Post and Forbes. And then I came across a study that was written uh, out of Ottawa, Canada, looking at the larger publishing budget of $25 billion. That's to broad publishing. That's not just journals. That's all of academic publishing and, and outlets and books and others. Uh, but I was just really, I was, I was struck by that as a journalist and then struck when I learned of a profit margin, you know, hovering above 30 percent for a lot of publishers. Uh, so that was intriguing to, you know, how can publishers have you know higher profits than Facebook or Google, uh, Apple computers, and so I wanted to to, to write about that and, and start doing what I always do, which is you know start you know reaching out and interviewing people and putting together you know kind of thousand to two thousand word pieces. I started to you know become more and more at least involved in open access and interested in it. And and those pieces that I wrote, Brian, on open access and journalism, those were some of my most widely read pieces. You're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of views and a lot in, in a Twitter world, amplification is huge. So they self-amplified and you start really realizing that there's a, maybe A, a starvation for this content, B, just a di dissatisfaction around the globe on how they can access science and research from academics. Mm -hmm. And you take those and you start to see the power. I start all of my university classes, the first class, and I talk about how many people how, how it's, it's such an honor to be in university classes. I have some of the best students in the world feverishly writing down notes, just like you did at U of M. And, you know, and I say, isn't it nice that you think this is the normal? You look around and see peers that are just like yourself. And you think this is the normal thing for a 19 year old to do. And I, every, every class I say, but you can't see the hundreds or thousands of people that can't be in this conversation, not because of any fault of their own, because of the ice rule of life that was out of their control. And because of, family or socioeconomic or political reasons are invisible. And I mean, I think that's something that higher education largely wants to embrace. So, I mean, that's one of our core tenets, especially recently, is just this broader access to what we do in higher education. Right. But at the same time, as I start getting more and more involved in understanding scholarly publishing and outlets, it's so exclusionary. It's extremely exclusionary. What we do is purposefully scarcity-based as, op as opposed to abundance-based. And in a digital economy where there's no extra net costs for distributing a product to one or a million or a billion, no difference in cost. Once that product is created, I see abundance as having a little bit more rational, you know, relevance to a to an audience and to a world, especially a world that wants synergy, a world that wants lots mm -hmm. of horsepower. And so that that kind of you know started to drive me towards more and more focusing it on open access. And if and so the more I focused on it, the more I started to get asked for interviews myself to talk about open access. And uh, then I would give sound bites to other journalists. And often those journalists would be contacted by the biggest publishers to say, oh, Jason Schmidt, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That 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 notion or that that figure he gave, that's not correct. Right. Almost hand sanitizer on the path. <laughs> oh, right. And how how interesting is that there's so much power with those profit margins that they can almost sterilize the the germs of the system so that their message rings loud and clear without any kind of dissonance well why have dissonance when you can afford to perhaps remove it from the equation so that yeah. for me a filmmaker started to okay there's a a massive profit margin b a huge you know, amount of the world that's excluded c something really interesting and funny going on here where they try to disinfect other kind of conversations and so yeah. that all led to me understanding that there's no narrative whatsoever for open access every open access sort of organization or group it fights incessantly both amongst themselves and with other kind of peer groups. So there's all sorts of infighting and never a kind of commonality of, of one direction. And unified is not, is not open accesses from a broad historical lens kind of uh, uh, attributes of success. So that's, 
uh, that was what I thought I could bring to the movement. Let me create a narrative that kind of encapsulates what I hope to be a somewhat a somewhat fair picture of the need for open access and bring in some of the world's hopefully most important voices in it. So that's what I set off to do. Well, I can see the narrative that's really strong there. Um, let me um, let me just, uh, friends, let me show you a quick clip from this. Um, this is, uh, uh, if you haven't seen the film, the whole thing is available freely online, uh, Paywall the Movie. Uh, hosted by Vimeo. And let me just give you a little teaser right now. This is from a discussion about the experience of paywalls. Um, let me play that. Willing to find another school. The academy writ large has not really to find another examined school. the full cost. The academy writ large has not really examined the full cost of scholarly communication. It's been really the library's budgets that have borne the brunt of that, and we've often had to go hat in hand to the administration to get increases for serial, specifically science, technology, medicine journals that have just um, had a rapid increase in price for whatever reasons the publishers may claim for that. And for profit to go up, scarcity has to prevail. Welcome to the world of paywalls blocking research. Have you hit paywalls? Absolutely. I've definitely hit a paywall. I hit a paywall frequently. Have you ever hit a paywall? Oh, yes. I hit a paywall. Quite often I'll find a paywall, yes. When I was a student, I definitely hit a paywall. I hit paywalls a lot. How do you feel? I feel really pissed. Students graduate, get their masters, uh, flow into those spin-off companies, and suddenly they discover it that they could not get access to the research results that they needed because they were no longer affiliated with the university. They came knocking on my door and uh, I had to tell them that as a librarian I was in this awkward position that I had to block non-affiliated users for access to publicly funded research. And that is is disgusting. Um, it shows you uh, many researchers, uh, librarians, uh, looking at uh, their experience. So, uh, actually, with one librarian, um, Lars, who is a terrific fellow, um, showing you how, how agonizing this is for him, leading him to go against the very grain of what he believes is the practice of librarianship. Uh, friends, I, I have a whole bunch of questions that I'd like to ask, but I'd really, really like to hear from you. So again, please go to the bottom of the screen, look at that white strip, and either click uh, the raised hand icon if you want to send us a quick question by text, or click the um, click the uh, sorry click the question mark for that, or click the raised hand if you want to join us on stage. Um, and in fact, uh, we have one question already right now. Uh, let me bring uh, Tom Hames up on stage. Let's see if we can do this. There's always this dramatic moment where I have to click the right button, and I did. Welcome, Tom. Make sure the connection works out. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, yeah. Texas. Hey, we haven't paid our internet bill here in Texas. We we have <laughs> walls instead. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, my question was simply, you know, if the emperor has no clothes. Um, you know, is, is it just institutional inertia that keeps these things in place? Um, and of course, the other problem with scholarship is, or, or any sort of locked up information is, what do you do with the stuff retroactively? Um, yeah. So uh, just wondering what you're, I, I admit I haven't uh, actually, I, I feel like I've seen part of it and I don't think I've seen all of it yet. So I'm going to have to sit through it again. But uh, uh, what are your uh, thoughts on that conclusion? Well, my first answer is I hope your dogs are doing well. Uh, my second answer is I feel that a lot of our 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 kind of innate inertia we're a, we're a large barge that can't really pivot quickly. And specifically, I'm talking about the United States. I keep saying often in my international travel, United States of America, and um, so. From a European angle, I think there can be a lot more leverage that has been employed readily, whether it be t 
Taiwan or Germany or Peru or Netherlands. They've done some top-down approaches that have dramatically changed the access that they've had to scholarship quite quickly. In the United States, it is a different, a different, a different kind of beast. We have all sorts of in, institutional. Uh, 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 ind individual uh, library consortia that makes a monumental move as a, from like a top down prerogative very hard to do. It's great to be kind of democratic and allow these consortia to have influences for many things. It gives autonomy to to states and to research co collectives, but it allows it it, it thwarts a, a large kind of mandate. So up till two weeks ago, I I really felt that you know the the future wasn't that bright for open access broadly. There's been some monument within the United States, specifically the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation backing of Plan S with their $7.5 billion a year that goes into science, which is which was bigger than, that, that's been a couple months in the making. Uh, but the UC move, the, United, the uh, University of California's move here two weeks ago to completely remove themselves from Elsevier, uh, Elsevier's agreement is a monumental one that is going to have ripple effects throughout the larger United States. And so I think for the first time, it can actually have, I, I have a positive view of what could be the United States future of, of broader accessibility and abundance as opposed to scarcity and kind of repression with academic research. Oh, that's a great question, Tom. Uh, and, uh, let me keep you up here for a second. Uh, Jason, I'm, I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about a couple of those points to make sure yeah. that everyone's on board. If, um, first, if you could uh, uh, explain, what is Plan S right now? Sure. Plan, Plan S is a mandate that's created by Coalition S, which is 16 top European funders that have said that anything that is that receives money, the only thing you, that gets action in anything academic or science is who holds the money. And these large 16 funders have backed Coalition S, which is led by Mark Schlitz of, of, of Science Europe. And they have said that by 2020, everything that receives funding from us will be open access upon publication. And that is a powerful move. Now, there's a, there's a list of like 10 mandates, which allows some sort of transitionary period, where if it's a hybrid journal, it has to be phased out within a year after 2020. And there's a lot of kind of push and shove right now from different scholarly societies trying to figure out how they can uh, function within the Plan S mandates. Uh, but another thing that Plan S does is it looks at what you just talked about of LARS of DOAJ and says that, that those open access journals have to be a Counted for in that DOAJ the directory of open access journal. So it gives a certain kind of level of metric of credibility so that anybody can't start a open access journal just by themselves in their, their computer. Um, so it kind of it's it sets a bar. And so that's that is the organization that the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has backed. Uh, and we also have the Wellcome Trust with their 1.5 billion that goes into science that has recently backed uh, the Plan S as well. And so those are going to have some major ramifications into the future. Well, excellent, excellent. Um, this is a- uh... Run into paywalls all the time. It was a real frustration for them. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> well, hey, the irony is, you know, a lot of us are in Western based countries and, you know, Again, that invisibility notion I already addressed from a college student is something that we as scholars also see because perhaps we don't actually have this trouble and it's almost hard to understand what that trouble represents unless you're out there talking to Nepal-based medical doctors or uh, doctors in Nigeria or psychologists in, you know, uh, in, in other you know, regions that do not have access. So as you talk mm. to these people kind of you know, uh, in a face-to-face, -face, you really realize the personal ramifications that this has. Right. So... In some ways, what you seem to be describing is a failure of communication, uh, leading to a to a business opportunity and scarcity. Because it's not like the reviewers get paid, the no. scholars don't get paid. So the only ones who are making any money here are the people who used to kill trees and put their names on it, and now may not even do that. Uh, it, it, and yeah, it was way better. It was way better when they killed trees because the profit margins weren't so atrocious. When you right. look at where everything got crazy is when 2000-ish, 2004, 2005 is when science, technology, and medicine journals just shoot up exponentially from the largest publishers. And that's right, right in the era when digital dissemination really starts to take a stronghold and no longer are we sending those tangible old pressed journals. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's this digital economy that's allowed the profit margins to grow, in my mind, just in a, in a, a capacity that 
you know, we can't really support as, as well-thinking scientists or academics. Well, this is kind of the reverse of what um, people talk about when they talk about the music industry, where there was the threat that digital, the digital revolution would destroy profits there. Uh, they managed to survive through an interesting way we can talk about, but um, but what you're seeing the digital revolution accelerated. They don't have a cap. They didn't have a captive market. That's right, like, and like like the academic world. Right. So I, Brian, I I worked at Atlantic Records. It was my first job out of U of M. I got a job at Atlantic <laughs> Records in 2000. It sound it was a horrible job, but it sounded cool. So right. I, I enjoyed telling everybody I worked there. I pushed paper all day, and it was horrible. Uh, cool. But that was right when Napster started with you know Sean Fanning and Sean Parker. And and inside of Atlantic uh, Records headquarters, we would listen to Napster and we'd say the quality is not as good. We have nothing to worry about. A year from that, all of our low level, low low young employees, we were all let go. There is no that that was just a ghost town. A a year later, after Napster really took its course, and and I was really angry about that as a young, you know, just fresh college graduate because that was my first real job. And right. I, the anger carried with me a few years, but now in retrospect, that illegal activity, which was Napster, and this is something I think we'll talk about later with SciHub. I know where Brian wants to go with that. The illegal, illegal opportunity that was Napster eventually created a legal, legal L opportunity, which is Spotify or Pandora or Amazon Music right. at our fingertips, in our pockets with every single song ever created on human uh, on, on planet Earth. And I think it takes that disruptive market, which often can be illegal in its original creation, to fully re- realize the user experience, which also manifests itself in legal means. Uh, there's a lot here. Uh, this is uh, th- there's a lot going on. Uh, can can uh, I make one quick comment, real quick? I think what? it's ironic in an era where we're so worried about fake news and information that the higher up you go up the information um, food chain the uh, harder it is to get that information. Connection? Oh. Oh. <laughs> All yeah. right, I'll leave you to it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's there's a, lot to, uh, a lot to unpack here. And again, friends, if you have uh, any questions about what we're discussing, please, uh, please surface them. And if you have any comments or thoughts, I'd love to hear from librarians, from scholars, from those of you who are in the publishing field. Um, this is the great time to ask questions. But let, me, let me ask one uh, just, just to begin with. Uh, so. Uh, for some people, uh, the service called Sci-Hub is a version of Napster for scholarly publication. It's disruptive. Uh, people often see it as piratical or illegal. Um, uh, its creator, uh, Alexandra Abakian, is hard to find, but you managed to interview her. Well, kudos for that. That's very yeah. important. Um, is, uh, do you see Sci-Hub as, uh, as a Napster for scholarly publication? And if so, what does it mean? It means the user experience of scholarship is broken. Uh, when you look in the United States specifically where SciHub is used most readily, Cambridge, Massachusetts is on nearly at the top of that list. Wow. What does that tell us about the user experience of academic publishing? What does that tell us about how we have to authenticate at home through our networks to get to go through and get our credentials? The credentialing of accessing scholarship is massively, and maybe not broken, it'll eventually work, but the, the time span it takes to do that it's not millennial based. <laughs> There's not very many millennials that are willing to go through that whole kind of, you know, multi, multi verification process. Right. So I think what SciHub shows me, especially from that analogy, is that we need to do better on the accessibility of scholarship, making it quicker, making it more. And, and, and that's from, a, a, again, a Western angle. Right. What SciHub shows me also is that, you know, there's now 150 million research papers that were created by people that were never com- compensated for the act, that were edited by people that were never compensated from editing processes, mm-hmm. that are now available to a global population. Chris Anderson, which, who's the editor of Wired Magazine, wrote a piece in 2010 called uh, Crowd Accelerated Innovation. And that was looking at YouTube, which is you know was big in 2010, and their abilities, it, it, its ability to massively improve dancing bet- between Detroit, Michigan, and Jamaica. Because all of a sudden, dancers didn't just dance in Jamaica, didn't just dance in Detroit, but now they spurred each other on a global community on. And that to me is synergy. That to me is scientific progress. That to me is Zika and Ebola and large and and, and clean water and, and broader perspectives. 
again, I'm from kind of a Midwest mentality of work ethic. And you don't always want the same mentality as of left brain or right brain or creative or, or you know, very analytical solving problems. You want a, a multitude of perspectives. And if we're going to do that, you, you need you know, for, for, for just the access, you need people to have a, flare, a fair playing field to scholarship, to science. And how, how repressive is that, that we support a regime that does not allow that to happen? It's, this definitely looks bad. Um, let, let's press on this a bit further, though. The, I mean, historically what happened was um, Napster took off, um, scared the heck out of the music industry, and uh, other... Uh, Napster-like services took off and appeared, uh, leading ultimately to the boom in BitTorrent sharing. But meanwhile, the music industry responded by creating licit uh, alternatives. The first one was uh, iTunes, which is still going strong, uh, yeah. based on Apple, uh, which used digital rights management technology to uh, lock down access to the, and repeatability of the songs. And then, as you said, we've had successive um, uh, similar digital music uh, enterprises such as Spotify or Rhapsody or iHeart Music, Amazon, and Pandora. Um, yeah. In fact, uh, this morning on Twitter, I, I read an excellent article about um, <clears throat> Australian researchers who were comparing the effects of death metal and ferals happy on people. And I wanted to start a new Pandora account just so I could play two songs like that and see what I did. But um, what's the looking ahead? Uh, do you see any version of iTunes, Pandora, etc., for scholarly publication? Is there anything like that happening? So there was a moment where the RIAA met with Steve Jobs. They brought right. all the top heads of all the record labels, only because Apple has that type of clout, into Steve Jobs' office or, in, or into Apple's office, and Steve Jobs appeared. And he said he wants to give them a, a, a flotation vest so that they can survive. And he wants to do that and charge 99 cents a song which dramatically changed the context of how we digest music. No longer is it the whole Pink Floyd's The Wall. It's now you have to listen to individual songs or you get the choice of choosing those songs. And that dramatically changed how music is consumed. And I think there's some real strong ties between that and how we can consume academic research. We live in a, a world that is very they call it CNS disease, cell nature and science. You know, we, we, we want our impact. We want our prestige of that journal. And that journal, it, the prestige comes from the covers. It doesn't come from the merit of every single individual article. If we start looking at articles as, a, as, as assessed just by themselves and not by the journals in which they're published, very similar to a 99 cent song download as opposed to the full album, we're going to now have a new metric, which is going to hopefully do away with something that I think is massively wrong and massively corrupt the journal impact factor. Can you explain that uh, impact factor to everybody, please, just quickly? Yeah, well, the journal impact factor is the summation of, of the, uh, the amounts of citations that journal gets over, I think it's a two-year window. Um, mm -hmm. So the amount of citations that the overarching journal gets over that two-year window, and then that is lumped into that one journal impact factor. But what that does not get at is the independent metrics of each article. And that's why it always, it, it always is generally, they, they want like stem cell, they want really kind of attractive pieces in those top, top nature and science ish journals because those get often larger citations and larger reads, which then helps to push that, that journal impact factor up. Journal impact factor is, you know, critical in how, how academics often assess tenure cases in, in, uh, in academic fields that, that don't have time to deeply go through and review tenure, tenure candidates, uh, uh, packets. What they do is say, oh, well, you had one publication in, you know, science. Okay, that's that's a certain credibility that we can bestow upon that. And and that creates kind of this, this feedback loop of always driving towards impact factors. So much so that if you get a journal published, a, a scholarly article published in a top tier journal in China, the government will give you $40,000 U.S. dollars cash. <laughs> nice job. Keep up the good work. We want that journal impact factor because as... China tries to you know, credential its up and coming higher education system, those journal impact factors in their mind helps to allow some sort of valid, uh, validity in their research and, and scholarly outputs. So, that, I mean, there's all sorts of complexities under that, but that's some of it. Oh, that tells us a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, our discussion here is becoming a, a kind of intro uh, seminar on how scholarly yeah. communication works in 2019, which is great. Well, let me um, add lecture uh, much. 
Oh, you're you're doing fantastic. I mean, you're 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 really really flexible, very very creative, um, and a great teacher on this. Uh, let me bring in longtime friend Roxanne Riskin uh, from Connecticut. Hello, Roxanne. Hi. Hi. Hi, Brian. Hi. It's an honor to meet you, and your movie was wonderful. Oh, it's thank long, you. So it's long, but I I would recommend everyone watch it from beginning oh, to end, <laughs> and watch it twice. <laughs> My question is, I have two, two young men in my life that are in doctoral and PhD programs. Now, you know, they need to publish in top yes. journals, ABC yes. journals. And what are your thoughts on uh, how academia is handling that, especially when they need to publish, otherwise their careers will not probably go anywhere. Right. right. Let me be clear. When I when I talk about removing them, removing scholars' devotion towards impact factors in high prestige journals, I would be remiss if I didn't say that it's. I'm generally talking towards associate and full professors, people that have already received tenure, because it's not fair for me to bestow my own sort of political or you know whatever access ideology uh, on those up and coming scholars if they're going to be in in fact uh, uh, judged in a metric that that does and it does you know, propagate that system. And so that's something that I think that those young scholars need to, to kind of, you know, be aware of is that there, there's autonomy. Provosts report to deans, deans report to department chairs, but there's separation between each of those. And those department chairs are often charged with doing the tenure cases. And those department chairs have autonomy from the deans, which have autonomy from the provosts for good reasons. But Department chairs perhaps are older and are taught, we, as we all are in academics, to stand on those shoulders that come before us. And it kind of perpetuates a, a, a kind of a, a continuing ideology, which I think eventually and I, I think hopefully is soon going to be changed. But it's not up to any of us to you know, put young up and coming scholars in harm's way for the for the betterment of all of us. I think, I think it, it is my, my my focus is the tenure review process that that needs to be this kind of our laser focus of what needs to, to have the the biggest uh kind of renovation from an academic standpoint and it can't be on those young scholars thank you for saying that well and clarifying also where do you think um libraries the heads of libraries what is their position right now what should it be in in your opinion what should their their stance their stand be on open access. I know many in California are bravely stepping out <laughs> with Elsevier. Their easy stand, if it's not going to be as aggressive as the UC system, should at least to be have an open access advocate within the library structure that's finding uh, finding access to open journals, helping other scholars in that university structure find credible access or credible journals for publication, helping to understand the the the, uh, the credibility and also the eight article processing charges that would be associated with publishing. So in some some librarian post within the library focused on open scholarship, I think is a great start. Uh, you know, not all of us can be as revolutionary or as powerful as the UC system. Uh, and I also think that, you know, understanding and supporting, you know, large open access initiatives, you know, whether it be supporting Spark, which does, you know, a lot of great things. Uh, Author Alliance is another great website that helps authors to understand their copyrights that they can uh, both ascertain currently and also historically. Maybe a couple of our you know, faculty in 2010 had signed over copyright not thinking, and there's sometimes legal recourse to go back at least to bring some of that copyright back into an open. So again, I think all those functions can be lumped into some sort of an open access advocate in the research uh, library uh, personnel. And are your thoughts with consortium, like in the Northeast, we have some consortium? Yeah. Is, well, that, is that a strong enough voice? No, it's not. It's it's not at all. Uh, you know, so, so my my focus right now is to find the big the big levers in open access. So we know the UC system is big. So me in the state of New York now, I have my focus on the SUNY system because that's another big lever that is currently up for renegotiation here shortly with Elsevier. So I mean, I, I don't I don't know how much dust I can you know raise on my own, but I think it's something that we need to figure. What are the biggest levers? And those consortia, while they're great, they often aren't very powerful amongst themselves because they're 
a very limited group and that doesn't allow collective collective action, on, especially on a large scale that's needed to take down, you know, a company that can throw billions of dollars towards PR and, uh, and, and kind of advocacy on their own, their own merit. Now, one more quick question. What do you think the students have for power here? What's their agency? Oh, great question. That's that. I, I would, I, I would go to maybe something that's in my film with uh, um, uh, Brian Nosek of the Open Center for Open Science, where he talks about uh, meeting young graduate students that are picking specific fields uh, in, with sub-disciplines in psychology, because that sub-discipline ha happens to publish open access. I think those those up and coming you know, undergrads or, or master's students can be more vocal, can be, you know, um, I know, a, a couple of great open access advocates that now do it professionally that were, you know, massive open access advocates as undergraduate students. I, you know, I think that's awesome. I think that it's something that's empowering the students. But honestly, I don't see very many students that, you know, I've, I've done a lot of talks on open access at universities around the country and globe recently. Do I see a lot of students? Not that many. More grad students than undergrad. Do I see a lot of faculty? No. It's it's general and, and that's really sort of sad, which is which speaks maybe to what we were talking about before the the the, the, the removal of cares from deans and deans to provost, so it creates kind of this autonomy that that unfortunately at this moment doesn't kind of you know light the fire under uh, individual disciplines to in fact broadly and readily a, a address open access. I didn't. Something see, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. No, no. See, um, did you mention ResearchGate at all or Plus One? Uh, yeah, no, uh, Plus One is in my film. Uh, 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 Academia.edu is, but no, I did not really. Uh, ResearchGate is in there briefly because Elsevier hit them with a lot of lawsuits to take down publications. But no, I didn't really tread deeply on uh, on ResearchGate. And, and especially now with their possible um, you know, joining pr potentially with some sort of Springer outlet. It's it's interesting to see how ResearchGate could play as a real dissemination tool for out for journals itself. Can you two uh, quickly explain yeah. what ResearchGate and Academia.edu are? Roxanne, you'll do better than me. Yes. I I I'm sorry. Can you, I didn't hear you. Can you explain quickly what ResearchGate and Academia.edu are? Um, I would let you go ahead. <laughs> And take that. <laughs> I, I know they're 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 social sites that allow scholars to continuously upload and comment on each other's scholarship, and also creates a, a venue for crowd curation. So that if I know Brian Alexander and he shares a piece that he likes, I can all of a sudden say I trust him, and so I'm going to trust his content more. It's the whole you know curation content that that works so well on whether it's, you know, Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, but it, it really provides an outlet for scholars to in fact share, hopefully legally, but often illegally their PDFs of scholarship, which is, uh, which has created a lot of turbulence for academic publishers to in fact put out legal injunctions to take down PDFs. And that's related to, related to the, uh, uh, on Twitter using the hashtag, I can has PDF, uh, for example. Um, Roxanne, these are fantastic questions. Thank you so much. And all, all back to those fantastic young men. Thanks, Jason. Oh, thank you, Roxanne. Uh, and you can see everybody uh, that it is it is this easy to pull people up on stage and and have them uh, share their uh, share their thoughts through video. Um, we, you know, I, we've been talking about open access, and and if I could. Um, again, I'd love to hear more questions and comments from folks, but I, I've got a, an armful to, to go. So while you're thinking of yours, let me just add this one bit to the mix. In uh, open access, we often talk about gold versus uh, green uh, open access. That is, in gold open access, the scholar pays to publish, either the scholar themselves or their department or a grant, and they pay for the whole process of editing, publication, distribution, and so on. Under green open access, uh, instead, uh, a scholar or their library or their campus hosts the content themselves uh, through a repository or a depository and making that available. What do you think is the, is the future of these two different branches of open access? Uh, which, which do you think is likely to be the most dominant or are they both going to be there? Well, you know, green's been great for getting content out there. Uh, green's been great for allowing us to always have some sort of uh, you know, Time is New Roman for the recent the recent uh, publication that might behind uh, be behind a paywall. Uh, but what it 
green open access isn't good at is for usage rights and data mining and the ability to really run deep analytics off of that because that doesn't come with that green repository system. Um, so that's where there, there's shortcomings in the, the, the green uh, method. Um, I think gold is, you know, it, it's better, obviously, because it has usage rights, but the article processing charges that often come with that are really not sustainable because it's creating these platforms that can still make this massive profit margin to give us access to research, which, again, was created for free and edited for free. So I don't think gold at the price point is the app at a, a massive high APC option is really the 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 the, the you know, the pathway as, as well. So I think that we're currently still figuring out what that method's going to look like. Um, and, you know, so, so one more time to bring in that UC, um, the University of California decision. So they've decided that to, you know, do away with Elsevier. Well, what are they going to do? How, how are the, you know, great scholars at UC Berkeley, darn, darn fine institution. How are those darn fine scholars going to get access? UC system sent out a short memo with four little bullet points. It said, I want you to, all scholars at, in the UC system, we want you to use Unpaywall, a system that tries to figure out ways to, to find a, 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 a legal means that is not, in fact, blocked through that large publisher paywall. It also said that we want you to use Google Scholar and find pathways through, through the Google Scholar platform. We also want you right. to contact our librarian because we have a specialist that we could probably pay massive, massive Boku bucks to at this moment because we've just saved multi-millions of dollars a year off of this subscriptions path pathway and let our expert help you human to human and let our, our expert open access librarian help to see if he or she can find you a method. And finally, if those other three methods don't work, then we want you to go ahead and try to contact that, that uh, scholar themselves. Because in my life, I've had literally 100% success rate. If I email a scholar for an, uh, for an article that they've written, I have a 100% success rate of them saying, yeah, no problem. Because scholars are not unabashed to share this. We have no scarcity with this. We've not done this for profit. We've not, we have no profit motives. So the ability to sh share this as an abundant resource, I think, is something that almost all scholars are willing to partake in. So those are the four... The four main outlets that the system of U the UC system with some of the most prestigious universities and the largest university system in the country is really telling its scholars to do. And I think there's there's something that can be learned from that. I don't know how that addresses the green gold necessarily, but I think it's a it's a pathway that's almost maybe it's uh, you know, it, it goes on top of those. Uh, it, it does. And um, I mean, it's. You know, we had an, uh, a meeting of the Open Scholarship uh, Initiative where we talked about rogue solutions. Um, and that is, you know, not either not licit or unusual solutions to access to scholarly publication. And uh, unpaywall came up uh, along with a few other alternatives. And those aren't illegal. I mean, they're just just unusual ways of trying to get at the universe of, of open access content. That's right. Um, so it seems like you know what you're describing is 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 a situation in, in this kind of phase change that from about 2001 to about 2014, we had this pretty stable lockdown system uh, of digital publication, primarily for scholarly articles. We had major publishers, you know, Wiley, Springer, Elsevier, who uh, ran the system, uh, generated a great amount of revenue for themselves, and and uh, you know, you know create this you know digital publishing ecosystem. But now we're seeing that begin to fragment. I mean, the, the, that system is still working, it's still making money, but we have all these cracks in the wall. We're seeing all these alternatives begin to play out. Uh, we're seeing open and green open access movements. We're seeing the creation of journals like PLOS. Uh, you're you're describing the uh, kind of disintegrated uh, reform movement, which includes uh, individual universities, individual scholars, individual uh, publications, as well as uh, university systems. Um, and it, it seems like a, a kind of ferment of change. Um, this is the in the future transform. We try to look at where higher education is going uh, over the next decade or two. Um, if I could ask you to, to look ahead to the far future, say 2025, where, where do you think this ferment is going to is going to head? Are, are, will we have a flip so that the majority of scholarship is available and open? Uh, will open stall um, because of all the challenges we've described? Will this mutate into something else? Should we be looking for the iTunes for scholarly publication? What, what do you think? Well. I, I think Kodak is a good good uh, analogy here. I mean, when they were looking at the half megapixel digital camera coming out, they said, yeah. ah, 
let's let's ask our customer base what they want. Do they want this digital half megapixel camera that you can hardly make out, you know, eyes and ears? Uh, no, oh no, that's we want high quality 35 millimeter film because that's the full, you know, depth. This digital camera is never going to be anything. It's it's this this green repository thing is never going to be anything. This uh, this archive.org thing is just it's it's not going to take the the credibility and the the full context of what it takes to have an, uh, a graphic editor and uh, all these agents to create it. What starts as a, a little movement that's never as good a quality is what all disruption starts as. And then it works on the outskirts and then eventually it overtakes that market. That's what happened with Napster. That's how, how, what happened with digital film. There's you know hundreds of these kind of, of cases where this happens. So what I think we're seeing right now is we're seeing, we're starting to see glimpses. We're not gonna see the, the full ramification, but I think what SciHub shows us is the user experience is wrong. I think what you know ResearchGate and Academia.edu shows is maybe the peer review process is wrong. We think peer review is a one-time, one iteration process that is, you know, it's like a, a stamp and then you're done. In right. a world that has nothing but kind of comments and a continual evaluation of, of content digitally, peer review should live on. And I think that's what these these other platforms can create is the ability for, you know, what, what was reviewed correctly in 2010, maybe in a 2018 or 19 vantage point, might not have that same sort of, you know, quality metric. Or maybe we found some fundamental flaws with some of the, the findings, or maybe that it's actually null. And we can't tell, you know, oftentimes you can't find, you can't, you know, re-represent a study that that was was found to have uh, you know had a positive finding that eventually became thought to null. That can't be often you know reiterated through the tangible scholarship. So I think we're seeing all these little grains of of what will eventually be a, a ramification of a new industry. What we're seeing the large publishers do is exactly what the large record labels do, which is a no brainer. If I was them, I would, and it's nothing against them. I would drag my feet as long as possible too. And not only are they dragging their feet, but they're trying to divest in new areas within the academic landscape. So now the the new academic sort of para, or the large top publisher paradigm is telling the university picture. Well, let us use our metrics to tell the, the research productivity for your university, where your scholars are publishing, where those journals are, are, are being referenced. And let me show your, your research productivity and let me package that in a really you know, great visualization so your university can then pitch itself to US News and World Reports and to all these other metrics that are really important for student you know, kind of uh, applications. And so that's where, and also with that method, they literally have a uh, glossy and a leather bound packet that they'll give to the university provosts and presidents. Mm. Darn you librarians and head librarians, they're way too skeptical now of anything that large for-profit publishers do. There is such adversary relationships, I can tell you, between the largest, you know, largest publishers and those head librarians, they're very kind. There's a lot of friction there. So those publishers love to go to provosts and presidents where she or he can sign off on something that tells the university's whole scholarship picture without having as many red flags perhaps raised as that you know, head librarian would. So they're really, the, the publishers are divesting and figuring out different ways so because they know the system is changing. And I think we're really radically seeing a lot of changes happen. I mean, look at the Journal of Infometrics, which is you know, a longstanding Elsevier journal recently flipped to MIT Press. Um, so th there hasn't been that many journals that have flipped. Lingua Glossa was one that did it uh, in 2015-16 in with Johan Rorick at the lead. But those are powerful too because it really shows the credibility of these journals is the full editorial board and has nothing to do with the publisher. You give me the same editors, the same the sa the same applicants, it has the same credibility so I'm, as, as far as anybody's concerned. Publishers right. do nothing on the credibility side. So we're seeing lots of new kind of Re, re, new themes that are developing quickly to hopefully point us to what the 2020, 25 picture is going to look like. So that's a fantastic sketch. Um, and that really gives us a sense of a possibility. It sounds like if we continue the metaphor that publishers are making themselves into a, a new version of iTunes. And then we're seeing uh, all these other alternatives begin to pop up around the edges. Um, yeah. Uh, friends, th this has been a rich, rich hour covering an awful lot of territory in, in a real hurry. Um, and I'm really glad for the questions that came from Tom and from Roxanne to Stalwart, longstanding friends uh, of the program and really support them. We're really glad for their work. Um, Jason, let me, we're out of time just about. Let me ask you one, uh, one final question. Um, 
how can people keep up with you? Uh, how do we find out about your work and, and where you're headed? Uh, well, we have our website for our film that's still updated with uh, with you know coming up uh, screenings. It's paywallthemovie.com. I also have a website, jasonschmidt.com. I'm on Twitter. It's Jason underscore Schmidt, and I'm pretty regular on Twitter. Uh, we are also, we have Paywall the Movie. Uh, we're on Facebook as well. Um, yeah, and I'm continuing just to, to be out there and you know, to, to keep kind of waving this open access flag that I don't deserve to wave, but it's just it's something that I, you know, we, we all have 40 or 50 years before we fertilize oak trees and we have to figure out one, you know, kind of things that are going to help this planet. And, you know, this is one thing that I really feel is something that benefits society. And it's, it's not for any personal interest. It's for you know, allowing the world to, in fact, have access to scientific and academic research, which as somebody in academia, I think is kind of a no brainer. So it's something I'm honored to do. Well, I uh, have to say we compliment you on uh, actually walking the talk and that you've made the film freely available. Uh, so yeah. that's uh, you have an open access film about open access scholarship. And, um, and because of that, we've, we've had 150,000 views of the film online. We've had 345 screenings publicly at United Nations, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and, you know, just wow. an incredible amount of, you know, uh, organizations and, you know, institutes, Einstein Institute over at Princeton, and just I mean, all nearly all the Ivy Leagues. And it's just been incredible seeing that roll out. Wow. Well, that's a real open success story. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Jason, for taking this time in this dizzying hour giving us um, an overview of a fantastically important topic. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to follow up with you, especially if you start making, uh, getting traction on uh, the replication crisis. Let me know. We'd love to follow up with that. We'll do and that. In the meantime, uh, enjoy springtime. Um, yeah, a, thank you. That means a great deal in the North Country. Uh, friends, enjoy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, don't leave yet. Um, I want to uh, got to tell you a couple of things about the next week, but uh, thank you all for participating. This has been a, a high octane um, seminar covering a lot of ground, and uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do that. Now, next week, we're going to continue um, exploring the future of higher education. We have Catherine Prince and Jason Swanson from KnowledgeWorks. They recently published a 10-year forecast where they see the next decade of higher education headed. So we're going to explore what they see happening over the next 10 years. Now, between now and then, uh, let me just tell you that our book club is having a poll right now for what nonfiction book we should be reading next. So this is the world's only book club on the future of education. Uh, we have a poll right now, um, and it's already active. People are fighting frantically for their favorite titles. Look in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. You'll see a link to it. Click there and uh, cast your vote to determine what we get to discuss. Now, if you'd like to uh, grab some books from that book club list, which is 16 uh, really exciting books or others, head to our bookstore so that you can get a chance to uh, pick some up while proceeds go and help keep the lights on here at the Future Trends Forum. Now, if you want to just keep talking about all these fantastically important issues, you can join us throughout social media. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter, or you can use the hashtag FTTE, as people have been doing the past hour. You could find Shindig as well on social media. We have groups on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for your participation. This is important work, and we're grateful for your discussion. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.